So, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm glad to speak about the, uh, my favorite topic, which is mountain pine beetle. Uh, just being a little nostalgic here, the mountain pine beetle was responsible for my career. I've been dealing with mountain pine beetle for the last, well, I guess, 29 years of my career. And it has always been a challenge. And so, uh, and you guys are going to be facing it too. So I just wanted to pass on uh, what's happening in British Columbia and uh, what is going on now and what we're trying to do ab about the situation. So as uh, Keith mentioned, I am the coordinator of the Provincial Aerial Overview Survey, which is uh, uh, the carry, carry forward from the uh, former Forest Insect and Disease Survey Aerial Overview Sketch Mapping Program. We cover as much of the uh, forested land base of the province uh, as possible using fixed wing sketch mapping, using two uh, observers, and, and basically it's, um, it's been done the same way since probably the 1950s. So uh, this is probably the longest continuous disturbance database uh, that's available. Actually, some of the data goes back to 1914 in some parts of the province. Obviously, they didn't use aircraft then, but uh, there are records going back for uh, major forest disturbances. So last year um, we had a phenomenal summer and we were able to cover 91 percent of the province which is a new record. And as you can see uh, pretty well all of the forested land in British Columbia was covered. So of that, uh, uh, of that area um, the mountain pine beetle uh, populations uh, were, were mapped and we were only uh, mapping the red attack so that's uh, what was killed the year before and faded uh, this summer. Uh, the numbers seem to plateau here, um, back down to uh, uh, around uh, 3, 000, uh, 3, 3 million hectares, which is about the same as the previous year, except the intensity level, the severity classes uh, go from trace, which is a very light, well, less than 1% of a polygon, uh, to very severe, which is over 50% red. Uh, and most of the shift has gone to, to trace, so we have lots of what we call salt and pepper attack throughout uh, uh, the northern, mainly the northern part of the province. Uh, so you can see the, the active populations are in, uh, in the north and the, uh, just have to point out that the little red dots actually over exemplify the, uh, or over state how many beetle attack trees there. The, they had to choose a point size to be able to be visible on this map. So this is in some uh, um, pictorial examples of the damage. This was done, uh, photos taken in McKenzie a couple of years ago, but it sort of typifies what the attack looks like, particularly in northern BC. Uh, and in uh, southern BC, most of the most of the attack is, is essentially that gray. Uh, and so uh, in parts of the, the central interior where where the outbreak started, uh, you could say the mountain pine beetle is an endangered species because uh, you can't find one, uh, mainly because the host is completely annihilated. So of interest to uh, you folks is what's happening along the border. Um, the, the numbers uh, obviously show that there's been a great decline uh, of mountain pine beetle, particularly on the border. It's mainly trace or very light attack. Um, further north, uh, you do have mountain pine, mountain pine beetle showing up very close to the uh, Yukon and Northwest Territories borders, but uh, those populations are struggling, as you would expect. And in uh, um, the su southern part of the province, this is uh, where we uh, are concentrating our management activities, uh, the beetle is very, at very low numbers. Um, and uh, we, we would like to think that uh, this is because of our aggressive management of the beetle. There are other factors too, uh, mainly host type and uh, it, it's tough going in the, in the mountains. So as I mentioned, our suppression program in, in the province, um, we stratify our landscape units into what we call beetle management units, applying a, a beetle management strategy to those units, Some, somewhat like Alberta has done on, uh, on their large scale uh, stratification. Um, but we have individual watersheds that are uh, basically a beetle management unit. And our objective in these uh, units is to treat 80% of the detected infestations using whatever means possible. Um, so we do a, a detailed aerial survey using helicopters. 
uh, followed up by ground surveys or, or beetle probing, and then follow up with treat, uh, treatment, preferably harvesting first, um, and then secondarily uh, fall and burn, which obviously is more expensive. So our justification for treatment these days is uh, the fact that the mountain pine has literally eaten everything else. Um, but any live conifer is now extremely valuable. Um, so we, uh, um, in the southeast, it's justifiable to do aggressive management, mainly because the threat of invasion from uh, the outbreak uh, from the essential interior has, has now waned, so uh, the populations we're dealing with are, are basically local. Uh, we've also, uh, um, we're looking at a cost-benefit analysis right now, uh, where we're comparing the annual management costs uh, to the stumpage differential between uh, what would be a, a healthy or full full stumpage rate and what we call minimum stumpage, which is what we would get for dead timber. Uh, we've used this um, cost-benefit analysis in previous uh, suppression, uh, major suppression programs, and it, it always had, had, has been positive. Uh, what we also would like to get, but of course it's proprietary, is, is licensee information on the, uh, the significance um, or the differential between um, red, uh, red trees and green trees, or in other words, blue stained wood versus white uh, healthy pine. And we know there's a, a significant difference because uh, uh, one of the largest forest companies in, in BC is Canfor, and they do market the fact that the, their mills, um, particularly in the southeast, have a, 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 a good supply of green pine, whereas uh, this is a valuable commodity in British Columbia and is now rare. So it would be nice to know what, what that difference is to help that economic analysis. Um, I know we're never, never going to get it, but we may be able to get it conceptually. So I'd like to show uh, this uh, graphic, hopefully it works. This is the time series of our volume, cumulative volume estimate of the mountain pine beetle kill over time uh, based on our aerial overview survey and then projected forward. So this, these graphics and uh, graphic products are available on, on our website. So this uh, projection has uh, consistently every year overestimated the, the amount of damage, which is a good thing. Um, however, uh, what we see here is uh, um, the overall cumulative uh, damage per year. And uh, in 2013, the estimate um, is 723 million cubic meters, or 53 percent of the merchantable pine volume in, in the province has been killed by the mountain pine beetle. And it's expected to drop uh, drastically. And uh, the, they've run the uh, simulation up to 2017. And the difference isn't that much. So uh, we think the worst is done. Um, and now we have to face the music in terms of uh, dealing with the impacts. So um, this graphic just shows uh, I know it's kind of messy, but what I'm what we're trying to portray here is that it depends on where you are in the province is uh, how much the impact will be. So uh, where the outbreak really started was in the central Caribou, uh, 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 Prince George area. The Quinell and Vanderhoof timber supply areas were heavily hit fairly early on. Um, they had uh, uh, a huge increase and a, a sudden drop as the mountain pine beetle essentially ate itself out of house and home. However, in Mackenzie, where the outbreak uh, has, um, has now peaked and uh, has passed, but it, its peak was much later. In other parts of the province, we're, we're seeing little peaks, but by and large, they all have declined, which is, uh, which is good news. And in some places, uh, we were surprised by the amount of uh, pine volume that has, has survived. So not everything is dead, it just looks that way. Uh, other factors in terms of impact economically is, uh, again, the percent pine volume in the stand. We have lots of mixed stands with other species that are still alive. Um, the history of the outbreak, as I was saying in the time series, the timber types, the, uh, um, you know, the, the site index and whatnot, uh, the actual ecosystem in terms of how um, 
uh, how uh, well those trees are growing and uh, of course the economics of, uh, of, of doing harvesting uh, in terms of access, distance to, to mills, etc. And the most important thing is the shelf life in terms of how long that wood is good for, uh, for whatever forest products you're, you're interested in producing. So the province um, responded um, since 2001 we've been spending a lot of money, 884 million so far on forest management and economic development uh, um, in the heavy, most heavily damaged areas uh, and uh, basically we're, we're trying to support uh, these forestry dependent communities on and trying to, to you know to lessen the impact uh, through support of uh, beetle action committees and, and whatnot uh, looking at other uh, resource development opportunities and other economic development opportunities in peri period. Um, in 2012, there was a report done uh, called Beyond the Beetle, a midterm term supply action plan, and uh, that, uh, that focused on, on several action items. Again, the, the, the strategy was to uh, support the three beetle action uh, committees or coalitions, um, and also uh, working with our partners in BC Hydro uh, to look for bioenergy opportunities. Again, uh, trying to look for more economic opportunities. <clears throat> These beetle action uh, coalitions are uh, basically regionally uh, uh, based uh, groups that, uh, again, are looking at uh, economic development, you know, tourism, mining, etc. Uh, policy, we, we'd uh, put in place a secondary stand structure regulation, but, and Dave Coates was instrumental in that. Um, to try to preserve our, our future timber supply, um, embedding pine and non-pine partitions, basically to try to encourage licensees to uh, to extract uh, the dead pine uh, over the um, the non-host, uh, trying to stretch out the midterm timber supply as best we can. Uh, new bioenergy-related tenure tools, again, the, trying to increase the opportunities for these other economic uh, opportunities. Uh, and in many places, we've had to decrease the AAC. Uh, we're in, uh, during the outbreak, we had major uplifts to try to, uh, to catch up with the beetle and try to recover or, or salvage as much uh, volume as possible before it uh, degraded. Um, so we've been spending we've spent $9 million in, uh, in the Beetle Action Coalitions, again, um, to implement these strategies. Uh, we're, we're spending $75 million uh, in Force for Tomorrow, which is a, a, a program that's um, been designed mainly to rehab um, burned areas. But uh, because of the Mountain Pine Beetle program, uh, Mountain Pine Beetle outbreak, we have all these areas that are now uh, designated as uh, rehab opportunities. Um, once the economic opportunities for harvesting uh, are, are depleted, uh, these areas are now candidates. Um, we also had this uh, phenomenon because of the large population of beetles, they, they started killing um, uh, plantations. So our, our larger diameter, older plantations were heavily damaged by mountain pine beetle. Anything over uh, uh, 15 centimeters, actually down to 8 centimeters in some cases, DBH were, were killed by mountain pine beetle. And this was a bit of a shock. Many, many civil culturalists who had spent a lot of money and time uh, doing spacing, pruning, fertilizing, uh, to watch their trees get annihilated by the mountain pine beetle. Um, and 25 million uh, in the establishment of a provincial bioenergy network as part of BC bioenergy strategy. Uh, 25 million to uh, the geoscience BC to explore central interior mineral potential. Again, searching for opportunities for economic development in these devastated areas. So what's happening in BC? The reality, you know, you may have seen it in the news. Uh, I don't know if you get the news from BC, but uh, we've had uh, several mills shut down or uh, transfer their. Uh, um, we had a swap between uh, Canfor and West Fraser um, in Houston and uh, Quesnel as a timber supply, and both of those timber suppliers have declined. Uh, the reality is they can't support uh, the major mills, uh, two major mills. So one of them had to go, and they. They made a deal. Um, we also had a, this a serious incident in Burns Lake a few years ago where we had a mill explode. Um, 
um, based, we believe, on, on wood dust from uh, uh, dry pine, because it was mainly milling mountain pine beetle killed wood. Uh, it's being rebuilt, rebuilt to, uh, to match the uh, now diminished timber supply. So mills are uh, going to employ less people um, because the wood uh, is just not there. And of course, we're all recovering from the downturn, the economic downturn uh, in 2009. Uh, and it's a slow process, as you all know. We, uh, we also have built a lot of our industry has uh, seized the opportunity to build many pellet mills in the interior, uh, which is supplying the uh, European market, um, which has been uh, a saving grace for many communities. Uh, we're spending more money now in, uh, through our inventory program to get a better handle on our young stand productivity. Uh, in the past, because we had what seemed to be an endless supply of mature trees, um, our understanding of the, or our investments in uh, young stand productivity uh, research um, has been, uh, I don't know, fairly low. Uh, but now the urgency to understand what's going on uh, in our young stands because these will be our midterm term supply and our future timber supply it has now become uh, paramount so more money is being invested in, in inventories and, uh, and growth and yield and of course there's tighter demands on the remaining future uh, remaining mature inventory uh, many of them this many of this much of this timber is constrained particularly in the, in the central interior uh, for other values um, wildlife water, you know, we'll be talking about water impacts later in this, in this meeting, but um, this puts a new light on, on, well, in forest health in particular, our, our program is focused on protect, protecting uh, mature Douglas fir and spruce, beetle, spread spruce from the, the, the bark beetles that uh, kill them, as well as um, defoliating management, particularly for uh, interior Douglas fir. And so it's actually uh, um, it's now made the live uh, midterm timber supply much more valuable and uh, hopefully our investments will continue in try trying to protect it and uh, understand it. So the big question I leave you all is uh, will this happen to you? And I hopefully we'll, uh, we'll hear more about that uh, later on in this meeting and uh, I wish you best of luck because uh, the Mount Pine Beetle uh, as uh, Les Saffronick said to me, he's the guru of mountain pine beetle, never underestimate the mountain pine beetle. <laughs>